Right, up next we're going to uh, change things a little from looking at uh, the chrono giraffe, the prime giraffe, to dealing with a particular problem that maybe you all have, but I definitely have, is you driving home and you get to your cows and it's freezing because you forgot to switch on the thermostat, you forgot to set it correctly. And um, what Tato has been able to do is uh, solve that problem. So worry about sort of the heating and cooling side of the world, worrying about how to have a great environment on my way home so it's not wasting energy and you know, increasing carbon footprint while no one's at home. It uh, worries about things like geolocation and knowing that I'm actually on my way home and then sets it to my optimal temperature. But what I thought was really cool in, in chatting with Michael as we was go, uh, going through it a little last night was, um, and then not just uh, setting it correctly, but also giving me some predictive maintenance, or at least telling me that maybe my filter needs replacing, or maybe there's another problem. And, uh, but without further ado, let me bring Michael up here to actually tell you what he's done and uh, what they've done. Michael. So thank you for the introduction, basically. You say that very well, uh, what is Tado about. Uh, yeah, so just to give you some idea why uh, we started this company is about uh, the third of world's energy is used for heating and air conditioning buildings. You know, like, how do you heat buildings? Just directly convert electricity or gas to, to heat. It's really a huge amount of energy. And we believe, basically, that by use of technology, we can reduce this energy consumption while like, keeping the same comfort, right? We don't want to ask you to just turn off your heating and freeze at home. We want to keep the comfort uh, and just still save some energy. Uh, yeah. Well, so, okay. Does this work? Yeah. Okay, so R&D and Tado, just quickly, what does it mean? team of scientists, as we sometimes call ourselves. Okay, this is not really it. It's mostly engineering, uh, but what's interesting at Tado, we really do uh, hardware products and we do all the development in-house. So really you have uh, hardware engineers, embedded software, server software, up to mobile apps. Uh, quickly talk about our products, not because I want to advertise Tado to you. It's really uh, to give you the context uh, about what are we doing, how are we using uh, technologies like Influx. So this is our, and since we are in London, and this is our one of the main markets for heating, I will just today talk about heating, not the air conditioning. So this is one of our first products. This is what we came up with, a thermostat. You connect it to your boiler, it can control your boiler. Next thing is radiator thermostat, basically. Connect it to your radiator, then you can control individual rooms. It works nicely also together. So basically, uh, your bedroom tells to the thermostat, I need some heat. So it turns on the boiler, and then basically you can turn on the radiator. Maybe for some of you here from UK, you don't really recognize this. This is how it looks in UK. For some reason, it's the only country which has the <laughs> radiator valves upside down. I don't know why. <laughs> Okay, on the other side, there are apps, which you can also use in London. Uh, yeah, and let me explain really quickly like three features of the app I wanna talk about. So one, what's happening right now? So this is basically the app screen when you see, hey, right now it's 22 degrees, uh, like I'm, ho I'm away, uh, someone is at home. It's really the current snapshot of what's happening. The next thing is we have what we call energy savings report, which is what happened last month. So how my heating performed, how much energy did I save, and why did I save it? And so this is not last 30 days, it's really month. Hey, in March, you save 31%. And basically the third view of the data is kind of detailed view of individual day. 
is basically the gray line you can see there is uh, the temperature in the room. Uh, the blue one is uh, the humidity, kind of the bars are uh, how much the heating was active, like 50%, 100%. Okay, so basically we have these devices and we have this app. And yeah, what this talk is about is what happens in between. Spoiler, there is influx somewhere. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, what happens in between? The next slide, I can tell you, I can go home now. It's, yeah. it's all in the cloud, it's amazing because we are smart people and we build amazing software. Uh, okay, maybe a little bit more detail. And what I wanna start really is from the device up to the app, really the whole journey of, of the data. And also explain what challenges we faced, faced on the way there. Uh, so these devices, this thermostat or radiator thermostat, you just attach to your heating system, right? It's like thermostat in your living room on the wall, radiator thermostat right on the radiator. And you typically don't have cables there. You don't wanna have cables there. So all these devices are battery operated. We also wanted to basically make it simple to change the batteries. So it's plain AA, AAA batteries, which you can buy in any store. And yeah, this actually influences everything. It's super hard to have battery operated devices uh, which are connected to internet. And they are connected to internet 24 seven. And you, need, you want that if you change something in your app, it's immediately there, right? You don't wanna wait like one hour, that may be one hour, every hour it checks in. You really want to have like the connectivity uh, all the time. Yeah, for that reason, you for, for example, cannot use Wi-Fi. It's just not possible to be connected to like regular uh, Wi-Fi and just uh, running on, on the batteries. Uh, yeah, so basically this is our biggest constraint. This is what we have to work with. And it's not just influencing the devices itself. It's really influences the communication, uh, the way we get the data on the server, how often everything. Uh, so one example, these devices are running super tiny microcontrollers. Uh, our bit older platform uses a microcontroller called MSP430. And just to give you the idea, what is this? This is a microcontroller, which is in the MacBook charger. And there are actually three microcontrollers. And this is not a one which kind of drives the charging or anything. This is a microcontroller which switches the LED to green or orange. So that's the responsibility of the MacBook charger in the MacBook charger. And here it drives the heating system. It shows you the UI. It does the communication to the internet. Okay, the next uh, basically field uh, this influences is uh, the communication. Like I already mentioned, we cannot really use Wi-Fi. It would drain the batteries in no time. So we choose this protocol, six low pen, not super well known, uh, but yeah, it's one of the uh, protocols in this area. You can maybe also could hear about Zigbee, which is kind of comparable, uh, or there is actually rather new standard of Wi-Fi called Halo. So this would be kind of the area we are talking about. So uh, we choose this one particularly we like that it's uh, IPv6 based. So actually the name, I have to read it, sorry, I cannot just remember this. So six low pen stands for IPv6 over low power wireless personal area, area network. So uh, that's the thing, but okay, this is not enough. Now we have this nice protocol which can transmit bytes very efficiently. Uh, but again, if we transfer lots of bytes, it costs lots of energy. Uh, so we, we have to also go kind of upper on the, on the protocol stack to use uh, yeah, protocols which are suitable. Uh, there we use co-op, that stands for constraint application protocol, at least this I can remember. Uh, and it's really a protocol designed to be used on these uh, devices, exactly uh, what we have. What's nice about it, and maybe also again, what area are we talking about? You might hear of MQTT, that's another kind of protocol in this area. We chose this one 
uh, again, what we particularly like about it, it was kind of designed in, uh, as a protocol for constrained devices, which is similar to HTTP. So everyone knows HTTP. And yeah, co-op is, is uh, yeah, very nice uh, protocol, which maps super nicely to HTTP. It, for example, have get, post, delete, put methods, same as HTTP, it has status codes, it has yeah, all, the, all the usual things you would expect, but in like super tiny package. So uh, like the method could be like two bits, not like six bytes, which is in HTTP delete, where basically every, which is text-based. So, so this is great. Uh, another, another thing we, we basically do is that every device is also server which gives us the two-way communication so we can address individual devices. And exactly for this use case, like I changed something in the app, I want it to be in the device as soon as possible. We can, we can push the messages. Okay, but this is still not enough. Uh, if we have these two protocols on top of each other and send the data every second, we will still drain the battery in no time. So like the next thing we had to th think about is kind of the communication patterns or communication architecture. So what is the way how we use these protocols? And yeah, just basically it's really optimized to transfer as little data as possible. So for example, we transfer the measured temperature every 20 minutes, or if it changes significantly, then we transfer it right away. So we have kind of, uh, that it's not really super a stable pattern of like, hey, every second, every minute, every 10 minutes, but more like, hey, every 10 minutes, just to make sure that we have some data. Plus, whenever it changes like 0 0.1 degree, we transmit it right away. We also designed the communication to be kind of fault tolerant. Um, and yeah, the whole system, I would say, is like eventually consistent. So to make our lives easier uh, on the server, we really uh, don't care if we lose some message from time to time and the whole system will recover eventually by the device asking again regularly, hey, is there anything new for me? And yeah, and if not, then basically it's like, hey, everything is fine and uh, no data are really transferred. So it's also quite efficient in this way. Okay, let's look into the cloud. Uh, Maybe something I skipped then from basically the, uh, when we got from the wireless uh, protocol to, to the ethernet, we transferred the data by, by WebSockets to be again able to uh, communicate in both ways. So this microservices, maybe I was lying a little bit, big part of, of our uh, services is still kind of monolithic. There are also lots of smaller services around, but this API server, it's still kind of a big thing. Okay, uh, so we introduced at some point this COA protocol and we said, hey, it nicely maps to HTTP and we really don't want to bother this much about this protocol because if you are building like uh, backend services, there are huge amount of tooling for, for HTTP endpoints. So we want to use it. We want to take advantage of Spring. We want to take advantage of these great tools. So we want to keep our APIs HTTP. So that's why we uh, introduced separate service just called Ingress. Uh, yeah, not too much fantasy there. Uh, to ingest the data and like uh, push it over HTTPS to the API server and again API server can send message to ingress, which then transfers it through the WebSocket to the device. Okay, this I think looks very simple. I hope everyone can understand it. And this works very well if you have one API server, one ingress server, and one device. This is uh, not so great. Uh, this, we need something better. At least we need more than one device. Uh, but yeah, this we were able to solve still pretty easily. So hey, uh, we have multiple WebSockets to the ingress and the ingress basically remembers which device is in which WebSocket. So whenever it receives messages, it can kind of look up in the map, hey, this device is in this WebSocket, so I will send the message there. So that was easy. Uh, we, but we also want to scale our servers. We don't want to have like one instance of everything. That wouldn't, yeah, this wouldn't scale. 
So we need more API servers as a first. Again, not that hard. We just use standard load balancer. We don't wanna also write our own load balancer. We actually, all this cloud stuff is in AWS, so we just use AWS load balancer. Whenever we receive a message, we send it through the load balancer to the API server. It goes round robin to the random kind of instance and, and back, easy. If we wanna send a message to the device, again, we just go to the one ingress, it will look up where the device is, send the message. Now, if we wanna scale ingress, uh, that's not that easy. Because from like classical uh, perspective, we could say, hey, it's a stateless service. It doesn't have any database. It doesn't have any data. It's super nice when we did redeploy it, we just spin up new instance, kill the old one, no problem. There is no database, no migrations. But it's actually not stateless because of the WebSockets. The WebSockets are the state. So if I just add a second ingress instance, then like half of the devices are connected to one, half of the devices to the other one. And if I want to send a message to one particular, I need to know where to send it or I need to somehow handle it. And there are many ways to, to um, to solve this, one thing I, yeah, what came to people's mind, hey, let's do some queue, some asynchronous messaging, because that's the way how you separate microservices. But we realized, hey, we could do that. But the nice thing about this co-op protocol is that it very nicely maps to HTTP, right? HTTP and co-op both request response and yeah, like the translation is super straightforward. If we put some queue in between, it's possible, we can do it. But basically we would be translating HTTP to some asynchronous message, then again to some request response, then we get response, we again have to create some message, and then again kind of transfer it to HTTP. So we actually thought of some other way. Basically, it's actually super simple, right? It's every time we get a message, to the ingress, we just store in some map where it is, on which instance of ingress it is. And every time we wanna send a message back, we just look up in which instance is this device connected and send the request directly there. Uh, and I have to say, it works super well. It was super easy. It still keeps the request response properties. Yeah, we are very happy with that. Uh, maybe you, you say, hey, uh, but then you need to maintain new service, this device ingress rate lookup, what is it? But it, like I said, it's a map, it's a key value store, so it's Redis. I, personally, I can tell you I love Redis, it's, it's amazing, super fast, uh, and gives you all the basic building blocks. One of them is map, this is great. Okay, now we finally get the, uh, the communication done with the devices. We have some messages coming to the, to the server. Uh, what do we do with them? Uh, if you still remember, we have these three, three use cases. So from the button, we wanna show you what's happening right now. And this needs to be really like consistent, right? I changed something in my app. I wanna see what was the last setting I could. I wanna see really the last temperature, not some temperature which was there 10 minutes ago. I wanna see that I'm at home or not. Uh, so this basically we require to be super fast because it's also entry point to the app. I wanna see the consistent last state of everything. The other use case is the, the, the complete opposite. It's like, hey, what happened in March? And I just, when April starts, I wanna see what happened in March. It's super static, one batch basically job which computes this report for every customer and then it's there, it's done, it doesn't change. Uh, yeah, and the last on the very top is kind of in between. Uh, I wanna see what happened yesterday, I wanna see what happened the day before. Maybe the, if the last five minutes are not there, I can live with that, but I wanna see kind of precisely uh, what happened uh, the individual days. Okay, so three different use cases. Uh, we have three different approaches to them. And first of them, yay, InfluxDB. Uh, yeah, works very, very well for this because it gives us exactly the query language, allows us to group uh, 
yeah, the temperatures by, I don't know, 15 minutes, half an hour buckets. We don't need to have every individual uh, temperature in there. And basically, the, that's the big, biggest advantage, basically, for us. The nice query language uh, gives us an easy way to access the data in perform one performant way. What's also uh, maybe interesting to know, that's kind of the different usage than what you have usually with like metrics, right? If you are collecting metrics of your servers, you have maybe big amount of servers, shipping huge amount of metrics every, every second, huge amount of data. And then you have few people looking at this data, few admins uh, trying to get the three most burning uh, problems and uh, trying to understand them better. In this case, basically we collect data for every customer and then every customer wants to see his data. So it's also quite some query load. Some like different people want to see basically their homes. It's like lots of, lots of querying. Okay, the second use case, uh, it's the batch processing. We use uh, Apache Spark to basically process all, all the data for, for every month. And as a data source, we just store it in, in S3 because it's the most convenient and cheapest and we don't really need it to be super fast. So that's it. And uh, yeah, what do you use if you want to have kind of the current value super fast? Redis, I love it. Yeah. Okay, now let's focus on Influx because that's why we are here. Um, first, we need to write the data there. Uh, our services are based on JVM, not really Java, Groovy, but doesn't really matter. Uh, so we use InfluxDB Java. And uh, one learning, basically, I wanted to share, uh, we use it together with Hystrix, for you who might not know it, it's a Netflix open source library uh, for fault tolerance and uh, basically preventing cascading failures in distributed systems. Uh, so yeah, so we can also nicely isolate our API server from, from the InfluxDB. We use Influx Cloud, so for example, if there is new version coming, it's very smooth, but still there are some, uh, some performance uh, differences dur during the upgrade. So if we fail to write some data, we can kind of capture it. Uh, it allows you to define fallback, so basically, yeah, maybe we can try again later, maybe we can just store it somewhere to recover it later. So these are all great tools which provides, uh, which Hysterix provides you. But on top of that, what we found out is very useful for, for specifically Influx uh, together with Hysterix is uh, the capability of batch data together. So how we receive the data, like one device uh, reports, hey, this is the current temperature. And there are hundreds of thousands of devices like that, and they report individually uh, the temperatures. That's not great for influx. It's not great to issue basically write, write every individual point uh, by itself. So we need to batch it. I think there's actually even some uh, batching capabilities in the influx DB Java itself, but we use Hysterix uh, for that. Um, so what does it mean? You define, hey, I want to write, uh, anytime I have 500 points or 1,000 points, and, but at least every 200 milliseconds because I also don't want to wait too long. And basically it, in the background, uh, takes care of it from your application code. You just still write one data point by another and in the background it batches it together and writes it in influx. Again, takes care of failures, takes care about, I don't know, shutdown of your application to make sure that the last batch is still written. And yeah. And the second thing, which comes with Hystrix kind of out of the box, is metrics that basically every, you, you, you have directly metrics of every possible aspect you can imagine. For example, the the batching, uh, another example is really every request, how long it took, uh, you have nice percentiles. Uh, yeah, so really good visibility from the application perspective, right? So we, of course, can have nice metrics from the influx on the receiving end, but we also wanna see metrics 
from the application, how long the query took from the, from the application perspective. And yeah, this is just one example from one of our application instances. You could basically see what were the batch sizes over time. Uh, yeah, you can see it's like 126 data points in one batch. It's kind of stable. There are some peaks. Yeah, and this is without us kind of configuring anything. You just plug in the, the hysterics and, and you have these nice metrics. Okay, um, so next thing, uh, we have the data there. We need to somehow get it out. And uh, yeah, with that, there were some challenges. And yeah, specifically three of them. Uh, just also poking a little bit to these influx guys. Uh, our favorite uh, feature request, I'm subscribed to it, I'm getting emails almost every day about other people commenting on it. Uh, fill previous, so that's a feature of influx when you can say, hey, if there is no data point in this bucket, give me the value of the previous one. Uh, but what we have quite often is very sparse data. So it's not just metrics, like, uh, like not just like sensor values, like the temperature, which is fine, but also like, hey, is the device connected? And maybe it's connected for three weeks, three months, a year. So what's the, it, and then I basically do query, hey, give me like report of if, if it was connected or not last week. So what's the initial value, where it starts? And there is no, value in the database, so basically we need to look up back the three weeks, three months, one year to find the, the last value, which is currently not possible and there is this open request. But uh, yeah, it's fine. Also with actually a big help uh, from, from you guys, uh, we, we, we were discussing possible workarounds, what could we do in our situation. There were uh, several other options, but we came up with this last function. And what does it do? Exactly what I described. Give me the last value before this time. And it loops up uh, all the way back to find the last value. Okay, so we kind of implemented the solution around it and then realized it's, it's too slow. It's, it's just not usable. Uh, the cluster was like fully utilized when we spoke to the support. It's like, yeah, we look into it and it's really the last queries. What happened next, we were really discussing what other options we have. Hey, maybe we can have some continuous queries to rewrite the, the values and really we are coming up to some quite complex uh, solution. And really we were getting to the state when we were about to implement it. And it's about one and a half year or two years ago. And before we just started there, new version came out. Just minor, minor release on InfluxDB. We got through the upgrade and yeah, we call it miracle of November 15 or something like that. Uh, it was super performant. We track it down to some pull request which changed like 20 lines of the engine and yeah, improve. For our use case, very significantly the performance. So that was so, that's great. Just the last one uh, challenge we, we faced actually this year was when we wanted to move kind of the old data to S3 exactly for this analysis of the, yeah, the whole month batch processing. Yeah, and we found that it was actually quite hard and quite time consuming process as we are in the influx cloud. So basically it was going through the support. But then again, we managed to do it. Uh, and as I heard, there might be some features coming to, to also improve it. So that's actually my bottom line, it was always pleasure to work with it. And as I already heard, I think two or three times from, from Paul and for Tim, from Tim, just uh, in past couple of hours, uh, software is a journey and I totally relate to it. That's the important thing for us. You will never find like perfect product which exactly solves your problem. But if you have a product which evolves and like react to your needs, that's, that's the most important thing. Okay, just basically my last slide is in terms of architecture, what I showed you before, would we plan as a next step to a little bit uh, separate the use cases? This is what we currently have uh, in mind to again separate stuff from the API server. We wanna just as soon as possible write the data to some storage, 
probably adduble skinesis, which will keep the data for a few days and then have two separate services, one for this room report, which shows you the nice graph of the last day. It will consume the data, store it in an influx, and then directly also provide the API uh, to, uh, yeah, to read the data directly for the, for the room report. And again, have the separate service which just stores it in S3 and once a month uh, process the data. And of course, Redis stays there as a cache for, for, the, for the last values. Okay, that's all I had prepared, but actually one thing uh, what I thought this morning that I would like to mention. Uh, in our application, we have some abstraction again about, about how we are querying influx and how we are then processing the data from influx to exactly kind of show this nice report which is smooth, has all the last uh, data points and everything. And yeah, there are like a couple of things like uh, cross product, basically combining, joining different time series together. Uh, there are things like filtering the data. Hey, if I have connected, 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 I just need like one interval when the device was connected and few other filtering like that. And yeah, we are really excited about Flux because it really seems that we can again push this workload from the application logic, from the in-memory processing to the database. Uh, so yeah, that sounds very exciting. We are, we are looking forward to try that. That's it from me. Thank you. Do you use uh, MQTT protocol uh, into your devices or not? And uh, if not, uh, why not? Thanks. Yeah, good question. No, we don't. Uh, we use co-op protocol, which is kind of the alternative. Uh, yeah, both of these protocols are basically designed for small devices. Uh, we found out actually still MQTT has quite some overhead for the really battery operated devices but probably would be possible to integrate it with, with some effort. Uh, at the time, there's also, of course, lots of history of every of these uh, decisions. Tata was founded in 2011, we started in 2012. There was uh, no real production ready broker for MQTT at the time. I think now it's like really different situation about this where also AWS, Microsoft, are pushing MQTT as the main protocol for IoT. Uh, but yeah, another thing we, we really like this uh, HTTP to co-op because the HTTP was something we knew. Uh, actually, the first, very first devices used HTTP directly because they were not uh, powered by batteries. So for us, it was like the smoothest transition uh, to some low power protocol. But I think both are basically option. Both, uh, it would be possible to have IoT solution with both of these protocols. Uh, are you using uh, self-hosted uh, Influx instances or Influx Cloud? Use Influx Cloud exclusively. Because that was our requirement, right? So before we started with Influx, uh, we had some self-built uh, solution on SQL, which evolved also. We had separate, several iterations on it to improve the performance. But when we wanted to replace it, we said, hey, we don't want to build some time series database. There are tools, right? There are column store uh, databases and maybe uh, with our super specific use case in mind, maybe we could build some database which for our specific use case work, work well, but we don't want to build databases. We don't want to operate databases. We are not a company which uh, makes money by operating databases. So this was our requirement, something as close to our use case and really tailored uh, to the use case, which is time series data and also something where someone else can take care of the infrastructure for us. How did you deal with scalability issues? Like, uh, obviously, as your customer base grows, you know, more devices, more connected customers without reducing responsiveness. Was that your, I'm sure, 
pleasant surprises with Influx, or, or is that something that, that you worked on quite a bit? Uh, as regards, so all basically the architecture part was about the scalability of the different services. As regards of Influx, basically, uh, when we introduced it, we kind of, so at the time we started introducing Influx to our system, we had this MySQL solution in place, right? So the first thing we, we did was kind of take the exact same workload we have in production and just run it against both databases, really in production. It didn't show any results to the customers, just like in the background, try the same workload on, on Influx. And that kind of allowed us to, to find the, the best scale, the cluster size uh, for our needs. Uh, and yeah, since then, basically, we didn't have any problems. We, we upgraded recently to, to bigger cluster. It was uh, quite smooth, no problem. So, so far it keeps up well. Then again, uh, the use case is not maybe super typical or very different from, from the monitoring or from CERN because we don't have 700,000 writes per second. For us, it's more the query performance, which is right now the limiting factor. So how many, uh, like the queries are a bit complex and yeah, so for us the limiting factor is the query, the query performance. It happened like when we introduced some like new version of the report and sent like newsletter to everyone, hey, there is a new report that more people open it, but uh, so it was a bit slower for a time, but uh, yeah, we didn't have any real scaling issues with Influx so far. Good, thank you. Yes, they go to multiple storages. Okay. Yeah. So that's kind of the. So we use Influx for the room report, oh, but okay. we don't use it for the monthly report. And we actually did. We actually, in the beginning, like the first version, hey, we want to try this feature. We have the data in Influx, we do it. And it didn't perform very well. And it was also like peak, right? So basically, we, we did, hey, we have this Influx and it serves the, the reports all the time. And then suddenly, like, end of the month, we want to get all the data for all customers. End of the month. It it, it was so possible. Cheaper, so you the, the right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry, your application only deals with heating. Why is it that I have to install a whole other app so that I can deal with just the heating in my house, where I have to install an app for my lights, my heating, another thing, and another thing, another thing, for all of the different things? Do you integrate with any other systems? Yeah, so Tada, as a company, we want to build heating products and services, so to be able to focus in one area. But uh, yeah, of course, uh, we also want to, so we don't want to build the whole smart home platform, but we want to be integrated. And uh, right now, basically, the most uh, popular integrations are uh, the voice assistants, actually. Uh, Amazon Alexa, Google Home, which we both support. Also, Apple HomeKit, which is supported, IFTTT, is supported, uh, yeah, smart things. I think we are working on, so yeah, so we are actually, it's priority kind of for us to be part of these and working with these platforms. Or is there something else you have in mind, some particular platform? It's not any particular platform, it's just that I don't like installing tons of apps onto my phone in order to install or to work with every single piece of equipment in my house. And it's often what I shy away from. I was like, I just want a single pane of glass to tell me what's happening in my house, not open 10 different apps to get every individual piece of my house. Yeah. So right now that would be uh, Apple HomeKit. And yeah, if some new great platforms come out, uh, we would be happy to integrate, but we are not the ones who want to build it. Thanks for Okay, thank you.